Greetings, crew. Good to see you today. I got my African Nazarene University uh, shirt on today, working with my shirt. And shout out to all you Nairobi folks. Uh, hope you're doing well. A shout out to my Mexico uh, working witness team. Uh, be praying for Dulces and his crew in Mexico. Uh, COVID has hit them hard and uh, some of their folks have died and uh, financially it's hitting them real hard. So be praying for them. Uh, today I want to talk to you about do-overs, new starts, the God of new beginnings. One of the appeals, I believe, of the video game craze is that they have do-overs. Uh, <laughs> you can save and start again if you die and uh, get a new start. Uh, uh, th that's kind of the theme I want to go with today. Um, but my heart is hurting for my loved ones today. Uh, I see the pain and turmoil in their lives. Many, many need a new start need the slate wiped clean, a fresh new beginning. But life isn't a video game where you can just click a button and all becomes new. I have these heartaches for my loved ones because I'm created in the image of God and I feel some of what he feels and he's hurting for us today too. But I have some great news, and it's this. God has provided new life for us, a new start. After the resurrection of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit, his followers were continuing the work of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord appeared. An angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. That's what I want to look at today, this new life. What could be so new, so important? that a loving God would put his followers in mortal danger to proclaim. Well, it was a new start, a new beginning, something better. It's a life that we were created to enjoy in the first place. Matthew chapter 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. God's desire from the beginning is for us to live lives full of love, joy, and peace. A life of fulfillment, a life of purpose. It's easy to see the need for a new life. Our world's in bad shape. Families are in bad shape. Churches, cities, nations in terrible shape. Recently, I saw a Facebook post from Cousin Anthony. Uh, he was addressing a current problem. Then he followed up with another post offering a solution to the problem. You see, our world is full of problems, but few real solutions are offered. Wake Up America is about as substantial as Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. <laughs> I have addressed this topic of the new life before, and I'm enjoying watching new life happening. But I see others whom I dearly love suffering needlessly. So I'm offering God's solution again. The problem. Dissatisfaction, pain, grief. Resentment, emptiness, loneliness, physical distress, and death. The bad news is the problem is sin and death. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. What we earn is death. What we deserve is death. But the good news, the real solution is this. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. A new life. You see, realizing the need is the beginning of the solution. 
Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You see, we're really at a good place when we realize our problem, our poverty, our helplessness to fix ourselves, and then to cry out to Jesus. And he offers the kingdom of heaven <laughs> here and now and the comfort of the presence of the living Savior. But there is the problem of the double life. Matthew 6 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. We can't be living like the devil and loving on God at the same time. You can't be going in opposite directions at the same time. You see, we've got to totally let go of the old life in order to receive the new life. But good riddance. Paul refers to the old life as, as the body of death. The Roman practice that he was referring to was tying a dead carcass of an animal are a human, dead human, face to face with the condemned person, limb to limb, face to face, tied up until death overtook the condemned person, yuck. That's horrible. But the good news is that God desperately desires for us to live this new life. But in order to enjoy the new life, the old life has to die. John chapter 12, Verily I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it only remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Then in John chapter 3, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You see, we can be born again. We must be born again. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. The old is gone. Part of this dying process is giving up the garbage. Parents of my generation have been subjected to Sesame Street, and one of their wonderful favorite songs was, you've got to put down the ducky if you want to play the saxophone. Sesame Street saying, let it go, move on. Giving up the garbage of the body of death is simple, but not always easy. As new life begins, attitudes change and faith grows. We receive a new hunger for God's love letter to us. It changes from something that puts us down to something that directs us and delivers joy. It changes from fussing at us to helping us. <laughs> it becomes a treasure. Some help in giving up the garbage is found in Matthew 6 in the Amplified Bible and the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurts and angers with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive your trespasses. You see, this is both totally necessary and absolutely doable to forgive. The illustration of this principle is this. When someone offends you or hurts you, it's like they give you a box of rotten garbage. It's heavy, it's messy, and it stinks. But we hold on to it because it's hard to let go. We feel the need to hold on because if we let go, they go free. And they don't get what they deserve. If we let go, then they don't feel the hurt and the pain that they've given us. And that's not right. And if we go on then and, and we go on holding it and waiting for them 
to come to us to make things right, always waiting for someone else to do something. Well, we certainly have more than one people, one person committing wrong against us. So we soon collect many boxes of rotten, stinking garbage. And, and some people, when they see us hurting, and they, they choose to give us more garbage because they see it controlling us. You know, these resentments affect our physical, our emotional, as well as our spiritual health. I've seen headaches, gastrointestinal distresses, strange illnesses that can't be diagnosed. These are symptoms of festering resentments. Jobs are hard to maintain while holding on to resentment. Marriages explode. I've been told by a physician friend of mine that the majority of their business would go away if their patients would get their emotional house in order. This life of resentment and hurt is passed along. Our children, even grandchildren, are affected. And they, they learn from us that resentment is the normal way of living because that's what they see. I've observed the generational curse of resentment. It's not pretty. And it doesn't get any better on its own. It sure gets worse. But, you say, resentment and hurt are always justified. I recall an article I read. It, it goes like this. A, a man brutally raped and murdered a young girl. He was caught and tried, and at his sentencing, the girl's mother told the condemned man that she would hate him every day for the rest of her life. I agree that she was totally justified in her hatred. But what she was doing was allowing the actions of someone else to control her entire existence. She had sentenced herself to relive the rape and murder daily for the rest of her life. And then to forfeit her freedom and then to forfeit her eternal soul as well. She sure wasn't helping her daughter. Someone defined resentment this way. Resentment is punishing, is punishment that we give ourselves for the wrong actions of someone else. But again, all resentments and hurts are justified or we wouldn't have them. But justified or not, resentments and hurts control us and keep us from moving on to this new life that God has prepared for us since the foundation of the earth. Forgiveness frees us from the control of others. By the way, Galatians 5 states that the free gift of God's Spirit enables us to be self-controlled. That includes not being controlled by any other person or by any situation. We can be free. We can be free to live a life of love, of joy, of peace. This is what God has promised. And this is what God has provided for us. Random thought. Hey, I have them every once in a while. After his resurrection, Jesus didn't spend time taunting or terrorizing those who had caused him so much pain. He forgave them. And he was free to move on with his great news. Forgiveness frees us to move on. That's not the half of it. This new life just keeps getting better and better. Uncle Solly Lemons, back at the Friendship Church, used to testify frequently that this new life was like nanner pudding. It just keeps getting gooder and gooder. A spell check went wild on that one. So, just how do we get free from resentment and hurt? It's simple, but not necessarily easy. Let it go. Simply let it go. Allow the real owner of the hurt and resentment to deal with it. When we belong to God, we are not our own anymore. And we are not on our own anymore. 
what happens to us is happening to God's possession, God's child. So let him handle it. We aren't smart enough. We aren't rich enough. We aren't big enough. But he is. See, as children of God, we're not required to keep score. That's God's business. We simply release all the garbage to him and let him deal with it. He says, I've got this. Now go and enjoy life. It's just like we do. We desperately desire our children to forgive and to get along. Many times I have wanted to tell little ones of all ages, let it go. You've got more than enough, enough toys. We'll take care of you. Get on with enjoying life. But most of the time they would rather go to their rooms and cry. Wouldn't it be great if our loved ones would forgive and give up all resentment? Would love one another and get on with living? Wouldn't it be great if all of our churches, our towns, our nation, our world would simply forgive and give up all resentment and love one another and get on with living? Now that would be a world that I could spend some time in. Somebody needs to write this down and, and share it out there in the world. Oh, oh, it's already written down. It's in the Bible. Great. Okay, let's give a demonstration. Letting go doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. But what it does mean is that we won't be controlled by the actions of others. How do we do it? Ask for help. God delights in freeing his children. Write it down. Date it. Then give it as an offering to God. Letting the old self die is tough. But watching the new life spring forth is a true delight. Jesus said that he came that we might have full, complete, real life. Are you living it? You can. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, open our eyes. Help us to see ourselves as we are and then help us to see ourselves as we can become through the creative power of the King of the universe. Amen. Hey, crew, keep those cards and letters coming. Let me know how I can pray for you. I love you all. See you next time. Bye.